Chapter 6, Intellectual Property, Part 6, Global Considerations. The learning outcomes include explore global protection of intellectual property rights, analyze appropriate and reasonable jurisdiction in the global marketplace, explain the sliding scale test for purposeful availment when determining jurisdiction, Articulate how enforcement of judgments is complicated in the global economy. The World Trade Organization is a multilateral organization that operates on several guiding principles, seeking to bring countries together. First is the elimination of quotas and other non-tariff barriers, streamlining world trade and providing a level playing field to increase competition among countries. WTO oversees multilateral trade negotiations with member nations. They seek non-discrimination for all countries or the designation of all countries with the same level of national treatment. WTO works, seeks resolution of disputes through the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, rather than trying to resolve conflicts unilaterally country by country. This YouTube video does a pretty good job of summarizing and explaining the World Trade Organization, and I encourage you to watch it. NAFTA is a regional trade agreement between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. It provides for many cooperative agreements between the countries, making it easier to move goods and services across the continent. Specifically, NAFTA provides for patent, copyright, trademark, and trade secret standards, and better enforcement of laws. The EU, minus the UK after Brexit in about, about 2019 or 2020, says that programs for, for computers are not patentable, and that patentability should be denied, mere, should not be denied, merely on the grounds that a computer program is involved, or if the program makes a technical contribution. There is a similar directive for, for those programs and they are patentable. Japan allows patents of computer programs as long as they possess a high degree of technical creativity and utilize the laws of nature. Hmm, that's perfectly clear, isn't it? In France, mathematical models and computer programs by themselves may not be patentable. The Paris Court of Appeals ruled that an invention, invention should be disallowed, simply should not be disallowed, simply because a computer or routine or technology controls several steps. The UK Patent Office states that software is patentable only when part of a technological innovation. TRIPS is a multinational agreement on trade-related aspects of IP rights. It covers compliance states, administration, patent issues, trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, anti-competitive practices, and enforcement. TRIPS states that all classes of inventions, except certain forms of life, must be given patent protection. However, it doesn't specifically address software-related inventions. The Patent Cooperation Treaty has 148 members, as shown here. World International Property Organization boasts 188 member states, all in an effort to improve patent protections. The Berne Convention, which has 168 signatories, as shown here, guarantees national treatment for foreigners who want to register a copyright in a country. National treatment means that you are treated the same as any other citizen of that country. It doesn't mean that you will be treated good or bad, just the same. Length of copyright varies with a wide range, as shown here. The Paris Convention has 176 signatories and extends national treatment to trademarks. Again, it's national treatment, not good treatment necessarily. The Madrid Protocol has 176 signatories as shown here. 
It provides procedural and administrative protections to countries who are signatories to the agreement. We know many of the laws that affect global enforcement of intellectual property rights, but how does a country claim jurisdiction? In other words, how can they compel you to come wherever they are to answer to the charges? Or how can they enforce a judgment against you if you aren't where they are? Purposeful availment looks at how to determine jurisdiction for things that happen in cyberspace, which is virtually everything now. At first, courts in the U.S. allow claims to be filed in almost any state where a website might be viewed. Soon, however, they realize that just because you use the web to promote your business, which everybody does, does not show a purposeful intent to do business in every single state. The courts have defined three categories of websites. If a defendant enters into contract con that involved the knowing and repeated transmission of computer files over the internet, then personal jurisdiction is proper. Thus, if you know and intend to sell in a location, then you may be called to that jurisdiction to answer for the claims against you. At the opposite end are situations where you have a passive website. You simply have information about your company and it rarely changes. Anyone can access the website, but you don't sell anything. The third category is the interesting one. Here, you interact with users to exchange information and possibly credit cards or other purchasing information. In these cases, jurisdiction is determined by looking at how interactive the website is and how much commercial activity occurs. So if your Amazon is pretty clear that you're very interactive and intend to do business in every state in the U.S., but if you're a small mom and pop organization, the, the distinction may not be as clear. The sliding scale test uses this categorization to try to help determine if you are subject to a court's jurisdiction. What law applies then? I'm confused. If a court is in a region that has laws to protect individuals from harm that an organization has allegedly caused, then the court applies those rules to you. In contract disputes, most nations honor agreements made, just like in the U.S. Almost all countries honor contract law. So we go back to that little I agree box that you checked and didn't read. You're now bound to it. How do courts enforce judgments? If the court if it's courts within the U.S., then judgments are enforced through the full faith and credit clause. As long as it doesn't violate federal law, then state judgments will usually be enforced. If state laws clash, then you might run into problems. If countries have signed an agreement that covers a type of law you brought forward, patent, copyright, etc., then the judgment will probably be enforced. If a foreign judgment goes against a domestic policy or you didn't have local due process, then the judgment is not likely to be enforced. If there's not a treaty between the countries that handles the law in, qu in question, then the judgment might or might not be enforced. U.S. courts typically enforce foreign judgments under comity of nations doctrine, but the totality of the circumstances must be considered and global legal issues just get messy. Let's look at a case to illustrate the complexity of international law. France sued Yahoo because it was selling Nazi paraphernalia, which is a violation of French law, but not of US law. Yahoo France didn't link to the Nazi material, but it did link to the Yahoo US site and French citizens were able to get there by simply typing in the appropriate website address anyway. France said that Yahoo couldn't allow any French citizens to view the material or make purchases. The California District Court disagreed, saying that the ruling would, like so many before it, violate the U.S. First Amendment right to freedom of speech. However, the story doesn't end there. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the district court's order. The majority of the court agreed that California should have jurisdiction in the case, not France. 
the court, court mentioned the ripeness issues. They weren't sure if Yahoo needed to do anything else to comply with the French order, and if so, whether the actions necessarily would affect U.S. freedom of speech. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court of the U.S., however, they refused to hear the case. The argument was that the French court order to remove the Nazi items from their website violated freedom of speech guaranteed under the First Amendment. The claim was at first upheld, but two appeals courts said that the courts had no jurisdiction to hear the case. Some of the judges argued that the U.S. would only have jurisdiction if France attempted to enforce the court order in the U.S. See how messy things can get when you deal internationally? and we have a good and close relationship with France as compared to many other countries. To summarize, many treaties and agreements attempt to provide global protection for intellectual property. Enforcement of the rules varies widely among countries and even within states. Countries with different individual rights may have different perspectives on enforcement of judgments. Jurisdiction is determined to provide a reasonable and fair option for both the plaintiff and the defendant. The sliding scale test for purposeful availment may be applied when determining jurisdiction. A global economy complicates the, complicates the enforcement of judgments and makes it much more complex.